Now for the juicy stuff, the global winds and severe weather. You can see how this is a diagram of the Earth and it's divided into sections and each of these sections represents a global wind belt, which we are going to go over. All right, so here we're going to be talking about the global wind belt. So the first one we're going to go over is the trade winds. So that's the one that goes from the horse latitudes or 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south and it goes to the equator and they are named by the direction from which they come from. So the northeast trade winds come from the northeast and blow towards the equator. The southeast trade winds come from the southeast and blow towards the equator. You can see how they kind of both converge at the equator. Prevailing westerlies, guess what, come from the west. And that's from about 30 degrees north to 30 degree, to 60 degrees north or 30 degrees south to 60 degrees south. And then the easiest one to remember because the name, polar easterlies. It's at the poles and it comes from the east and it goes down towards the equator. All right, and you can kind of see that there, yes, look, it's a mirror image of each of itself at the equator. It divides it and it's a mirror image. All right, now for our calm winds and the jet stream. So the first calm wind is, I referenced it last time, it's the horse latitude, so it's located at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator, and it's just kind of this band, and just ignore that the other stuff going on for right now. It's weak winds, okay? The doldrums is the other weak winds. It's found at the equator, and it's weak there because like you just saw with the convergence of the trade winds. All right, the jet stream, super cool. It's this narrow band of really strong winds in the upper atmosphere, and you can see here that we actually have four jet streams on the Earth, and it changes every day. So these squiggles change every day based on these warm air masses and these cold air masses because the jet stream follows the boundary between the warm and the cold air mass. Everybody's favorite, severe or bad weather. All right, we gotta start small. So we're gonna start with thunderstorms. Thunderstorms, guess what? Hey, thunder, lightning, rain, lots of rain, gusty winds, and hail can be produced from thunderstorms. And if you look down here, we can look at the development of a thunderstorm. So, just like we learned about, in order for a thunderstorm to develop, you have to have that warm air rising, right? So those are called updrafts and they kind of, you know, once they get to the cold area, they will condense into a cloud. That is our cumulus stage. You notice we don't have any rain yet. In our mature stage, you notice that we'll have lightning, lots of rain. Okay, so we're still getting a lot of these updrafts, which is fueling our thunderstorm. But the cloud is also saturated, so now we also are getting these now downdrafts in the rain. All right, and then in our dissipating stage, that's where it's kind of dying off and we're just getting light rain. No more updrafts, no more fuel for the storm. Fun fact, lightning caused by charges in the clouds produced from rain and hail and all those things flying around in there. So opposites attract, once you get opposite charges, you get lightning. All right, tornadoes. Tornadoes are a vortex of rapidly rotating air that form in our cumulonimbus clouds, and they uh, also need a very low central pressure in order to form. So over here, here's a picture of a nice tornado kind of touching ground. And over here, we have uh, the, the beginnings of a tornado. All right, a water spout is a tornado that occurs over a body of water. And this is actually the one from Hampton in 2012. So the recipe for a tornado. First we need a severe thunderstorm, a nice big cumulonimbus cloud. And then we need an updraft or, you know, rising warm moist air. Okay, so again that's going to be our fuel. And as this air rises, tornadoes actually form in an area where there's couple different air masses going on. So these converging air masses are going to cause the winds in the updraft to rotate or spin, which is referred to as a mesocyclone. 
Okay, so once the mesocyclone or the vortex extends to the ground, it actually forms the tornado. And if you're, you know, reading these words here, you notice that we see this supercell storm. A supercell thunderstorm is just one that can last for many hours. So it is there and it has the possibility to produce a, a pretty nice tornado. However, they don't last long. They can last anywhere from a few minutes to as long as 30 minutes. Tornadoes most often occur in Tornado Alley, which is right here, and they occur in Tornado Alley, be in, usually in the spring and summertime, because we have all these converging air masses. We have this warm, moist air coming up, this cold, dry air, warm, dry air, that's our CT, continental tropical maritime, tropical, and then we have our continental polar all converging in this one area, and that's going to cause us to experience a lot of tornadoes in what they call Tornado Alley. Tornadoes are measured using the Fujita scale, which measures its intensity by determining the worst damage produced because they can't actually measure the winds. All right, so a tornado watch is it alerts us to the possibility that one could happen, and a warning is where we've actually sighted a tornado or there's a tornado there indicated by weather radar. All right, so here is a table with the Fujita scale. You notice that all of these are all estimates, and the intensity ranges from 0 to 5, and they're all given some F0, F1, F2, etc. But it's based on the damage that is caused. Here recently, they've actually implemented an enhanced Fujita scale as of 2007. So it's still on estimated wind speed, but now we have 28 damage indicators as well. Hurricanes, we are so very familiar with these. Hurricanes are tropical low pressure cyclones. So we have this counterclockwise movement of air, and they must have a wind speed of at least 75 miles per hour in order to be considered a hurricane and they need to form over warm water. Here's a diagram of a hurricane so you can kind of see just like with all the other stuff we've got this really big cloud you know cumulonimbus cloud we have this warm moist air rising upwards that's going to be our fuel okay and we have these spinning see cyclone counterclockwise okay and you know that in the center of the hurricane is the eye, which is kind of where the winds die down. All right, so don't let this diagram fool you. Hurricanes are actually quite humongous. And we'll get most hurricanes from about 5 degrees and 20 degrees north and south of the equator. So this little band right here, which since it's at the equator, it's getting a lot of sunlight which is why hurricanes, because hurricanes need warm water in order to form. And our hurricane season just ended, actually. Went from June 1st to about November 30th. All right, if you're a storm tracker, you've probably seen this, but uh, the progression of a hurricane, they all start as tropical depressions, and that's based on their wind speed. Okay, so if their wind speed increases, then they are called tropical storms and they're given names. And once they reach 74 miles per hour, they are called hurricanes. The average hurricane is about 300 miles in diameter and lasts about 10 days. Even though the average is 300, that means that we can have anywhere from 100 miles to 500 mile diameter stretching across. Uh, that's the size of the hurricane. They all have that central eye and hurricanes are also known as typhoons or cyclones, depending on where you live. Believe it or not, most deaths occur from the flooding. And here is a picture of Hurricane Katrina. Now most of the flooding comes from the storm surge, which is the abnormal rise of sea level along the shore as a result of the strong winds. So it's going to be most damaging at high tide. And you can see this picture here that uh, the waves are kind of coming up over the road. 
All right, and hurricane intensity is measured using the Saffir Simpson scale. So we can actually measure these wind speeds. That's why we have them here. This one is kilometers per hour, and uh, they're measured in categories one through five. And you can see increasing storm surge with increasing categories of hurricane. So much more damage, five being the worst. So here is a map that we use in the Atlantic actually to track hurricanes. So you can see here we have all our latitudes and our longitudes, and you can follow the path of the hurricane.